or well done. But when news happens after this show ends, like the State of the Union address last night, you come here at 3 p.m. and most that can be said is beyond well done. But I will share a few observations about last night's speech and, of course, welcome your calls, too. First, I found it a little strange how a State of the Union speech with, would open with so much about two other countries, neither of them the United States. He opened with a lot of talk about Ukraine and Russia, and it constituted, by my count, 20 percent of his speech, again titled State of the Union, not State of the World or State of the Universe. Maybe it's the old speechwriter in me, but I just found that a little odd, an awfully long beginning about two other countries, neither of them ours. Now, I understand a bit why that might have been decided upon. First, I think Joe Biden and this administration are doing everything they possibly can to show the Joe Biden who can bring unity to this country. And he seized upon the near universal respect for Ukraine. That unity, that was his calling card in 2020. That's what he sold to us. And, of course, he governed up until now as a disuniter, going so far this year as to call Republicans members of the party of Bull Connor and George Wallace and Jefferson Davis. It should say something about this great uniter that he needs to look to other countries to forge unity over his presidency here. I haven't heard anyone else mention that. Maybe I'm alone in thinking that. It is true there is a near unanimous sympathy for the Ukrainians, and I share in it. So I get why this president spent the first part of his speech on it and so much time on it. Also, despite whatever sleight of hand the best political consultants can come up with, the state of our union is not strong. Doubly odd that to find strength of mission, we look again to two other countries. But then there's what was said about Ukraine and Russia specifically, and it just doesn't parse, not to the philosophical ear anyway. Joe Biden said, quote, when dictators do not pay a price for their aggression, they cause more chaos. They keep moving and the costs, the threats to America and America to the world keeps rising. You know what's odd about that, even disorienting? The president, at the same time he tells us this, is hell-bent on delivering a gift basket to Iran in order to secure Iran's word on nuclear proliferation. And worse, this administration is working with, wait for it, Russia to appease Iran. You think about our history there, ancient and modern, and you have the most rogue state in the world, or maybe the second most rogue state in the world, that has made a hobby of attacking and killing Americans for decades, for, and we are begging them to meet with us so that we can, as Barack Obama did, shovel money at them, all with the help of Russia. The second thing that clanged was when Joe Biden said, quote, Putin's latest attack on Ukraine was premeditated and totally unprovoked. He rejected repeated efforts at diplomacy, close quote. Odd thing to say. Is that not an admission against interest? An admission of failure? Whose efforts at diplomacy? Obviously the United States' efforts. Joe Biden's efforts. Those efforts failed. And Vladimir Putin saw enough and heard enough of Joe Biden to think those efforts should fail and would, and that the United States could be dismissed. And why? Despite all the boisterousness and uproarious speech about standing with Ukrainians and the isolating of Vladimir Putin, it is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing, to borrow from Macbeth. Putin, like old man River, just keeps rolling along. The sanctions are failing. The unity of Europe is failing, and the United States can offer little more than collective virtue signaling which seems to me a pretty good summary of Joe Biden's presidency in the first place. The other observation, getting to that point, is his State of the Union speech was a speech to be given, and given, as if everything was going just fine and dandy here, as if the times were normal and nearly every policy objective wasn't failing or heading south from where it was a year or so ago. It was a speech of normalcy designed for normal times. Nothing wrong. Nothing catastrophic, 
Nothing needed to be improved radically or changed even marginally. Not on our border, not in regard to the cost of living, not on our energy dependence, not on the Middle East or Afghanistan, not on COVID and the aftershocks of the mediation efforts, not drug overdose deaths, not on transportation problems, not on gas prices, not on inflation, not on education, <clears throat> not on any policy item one can think of. Not a single public policy index is doing better than it was a year or so ago, and almost all of them are worse, much worse. This was a speech that at best was callous in recognizing all of this. Tone deaf would be the polite way to put it, the polite way, which is why I do not believe Joe Biden will get much of a poll bump that lasts more than a week from his speech last night, which is why you do not see Democrats running for state and federal office seeking an event with him or the vice president, as you would usually expect. Who wants Jimmy Carter vouching for them, after all? And it tells the American people, by negative inference, this White House does not get it. With a CNN approval rating of 40 percent and a CNN disapproval rating 14 points higher at 54 percent, one of the worst, if not the worst, of any president at this point in his presidency, there seems to be no acknowledgement whatsoever that what is coming from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is both wrong and, consequently, not working and not making Americans happy. It's almost as if Biden and Harris are looking around the country and the world and saying, we got them right where we want them. It's disconnected from the country they govern or were elected to govern, and it's disconnected from reality. It also won't matter all that much. There are very few States of the Union speeches that are that memorable. Reagan had one, Clinton had one, and that was about it in our lifetimes. Donald Trump had a memorable one in that Nancy Pelosi physically and theatrically tore his up on national and international television, you know, because bipartisanship and unity and respect for the office, I said sarcastically. Even as the Democrats tell us Republicans are the dividers in this country. There was one other State of the Union that has a memorable line, and it was Abraham Lincoln's, where he concluded this way, quote, Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. We of this Congress and this administration will be remembered in spite of ourselves. No personal significance or insignificance can spare one or another of us. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. We say we are for the Union. The world will not forget that we say this. We know how to save the Union. The world knows we do know how to save it. We, even we here, hold the power and bear the responsibility. In giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free, honorable alike in what we give and what we preserve. We shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope of earth. Other means may succeed. This could not fail. The way is plain, peaceful, generous, just a way which, if followed, the world will forever applaud and God must forever bless, close quote. Now, two things to say here. Joe Biden has a war he wants to use or at least work on or about or leverage. He cannot say we know how to save the victim, the Ukrainians, and he cannot say the world knows we know how to do this because all we seem to be able to do is say sanctions will take time as the butter of Ukraine melts by the day in the stove of Russia. The other thing to say about this is when's the last time you heard a Democrat say we have the last best hope of Earth? Another word for that is great or greatness. And the Democrats, along with their minions and Amon Corners and the academies and the elite culture, wish us to think America is a down market commodity. Never that great and certainly not the best hope. That all said, there was just one more little thing about the speech which was it was clearly rewritten a bunch. Notice the transitions from the topics covered last night in the speech. There were none. There was no flow. There were no transitions. It was just an itemized list with no segues. Beyond that, let's ask ourselves some tough questions. This is clearly a trying and a testing time. 
what is to be done? If the polling won't move this administration, what will? Obviously a message to be sent to Washington this November. Thus, obligations and efforts must change. It is now up to us to move things, to send the message, and then to execute on it. Thus, as I've said before, since the burden is on us, how are we going to meet it? You're watching primary ads for various offices right now, and some of you are running for offices yourself, which is great. And I'm more gratified than ever before that I keep meeting people, as I did earlier today, running for what is perhaps the most important office one can run for, school board. If you are not running yourself, though, do not let America's decline become a spectator sport. Get involved. And when you get involved, you know what I keep saying about these primaries? Ask yourself a fundamental question about the candidates running. Have they been there for our cause and our causes for more than an election cycle, more than a year? Have they shown you their sermons? Or are they just now trying to convince you of their conviction and solidity by giving you sermons? And how long have they been giving those sermons? Take these primaries seriously. There's an old rule. <coughs> There's an old rule invoked now and again named after William F. Buckley. It's called the Buckley Rule. It came out of an interview he gave in 1967. And it, to quote him directly, is this. Quote, be for the most right, viable candidate who could win, close quote. Pretty good rule. I don't know of one better. And there's a lot in it, actually, a lot to it. Where has your candidate been? What has he or she done? And is it new to you and new to us? And can they defeat the Democrat? Those of you who were there may remember this, but the year was 2015, and we at 960 held a town hall on the Republican primary debates. I was asked who I supported. And this was before Donald Trump had shown his full hand of conservatism. I'd done a little research, and while he had gone back and forth at times in his history, I'd seen Donald Trump's conservatism in the past. I'd seen him stand up for Dan Quayle when Quayle was the pinata Trump would become, not by dint of Quayle or Trump, but by dint of the Democrats and the media efforts to taint and tarnish them. And I said it makes no difference to me if our candidates get to the Super Bowl or if our candidate gets to the Super Bowl and can't win. I'm for Trump because he's the only one that can win next year, I said, certainly against Hillary Clinton. He was the most right, viable candidate who could win, as Buckley put it. I ask you to think of it that way, along those lines, as we send the message and do our duty as we know it to save this, the last best hope of Earth.